Okay, so welcome back to the UCL InfoSec Research Seminar. And today we have Henry Skeok, who is a second year PhD student at the UCL Center for Doctrinal Training in Cybersecurity. And he's supervised by David Pim and Christoph, Christos Ioan Anidis. And Henry will tell us everything about cyber insurance. And hopefully at the end, we'll see what the right price is. So Henry, the floor is yours. Great, thanks Philip. And um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so um, this uh, talk basically is presenting the results of the um, first year CDT project I did looking at um, cyber insurance and specifically how you can expand the Gordon Love model for security investment to um, cyber insurance. Um, this is the second of the uh, three uh, CDT talks we've got. Antonio's got us off to a great start last week, and then Ariana's um, coming up next week uh, talking about cryptocurrencies and law. So I guess this week and next for a slight diversion from what we usually talk about in the uh, information security seminars, but I hope you'll uh, tolerate the economics. Um, it, it does have some, some useful applications, I think, um, to research and information security. Um, so I mean, to start off with, I mean, there's a bit of a cartoon here, which I think sums up sort of the popular view of um, cyber insurance. And certainly when I told people I know who work in insurance that I was going off to do a PhD looking at cyber, sort of these were some of the things I, I heard, you know, I won't pay out. Um, if the attack comes from a nation state, the insurer might claim it's an act of war and then not pay out. And, you know, oh, well, people invest a lot in security. So we don't really need cyber insurance as our defenses are really um, are really good. And, and that sort of thing. Um, so the reality actually is that according to this survey, um, which I think was done by Zurich, um, you know, one of the world's largest insurance companies, and it's always important to interpret these things, you know, with a, with a grain of salt. But um, according to them, 75% of organizations have been purchasing some form of, of cyber insurance. So it's gone from something 10 years ago that, that, that was quite you know, niche um, to actually quite an active, um, an active market. It, it's very heavily concentrated in the United States. I think broadly speaking, people think about 90% of the market is US um, domiciled and then about 10% sort of um, elsewhere. I think there's a, there's a lot of scope for growth in, in the UK at, at the moment. Um, just uh, recently, the National Cybersecurity Centre in the UK actually published some guidelines um, for organisations looking to take out cyber insurance, how to interpret the different policies available and um, you know, what, what to look for, what, what's suitable, what isn't, and, and so on and, and so forth. And I think that that's quite important because, as the cartoon suggested, it is quite a complicated sort of type of insurance to navigate if you're not necessarily and uh, information security uh, security specialist. So in terms of what it is, um, this is something which I adapted from the Association of British uh, Insurers, which is sort of the industry body in the, um, in the UK for insurance. I mean, the definition down the slide is pretty self-explanatory. And then you can split it into first party and third party insurance, basically, whether you want it to cover you as an individual, your organization, or the um, effects of a data breach, cyber attack, or so on on others. There's a bit of an open question in terms of insurance of regulatory fines and GDPR. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm not a lawyer, um, but what the sort of argument I'd always understood is that you can't insure in the UK against criminal um, negligence. So if you've done something that's clearly a criminal act, the insurance won't cover you. But under GDPR, you know, there's an argument that somebody could be negligent without meaning to be or being aware of it. And then there's sort of a slightly gray area. And I think that's an ongoing um, area, area of, um, of discussion. But obviously, for a lot of companies who are facing or holding consumer data, the risks of a regulatory fine under GDPR is something which um, which is a real concern because we all know it, it can be the fines can be potentially very um, very significant. So in terms of the field of um, research, I think cyber insurance is quite well established um, sort of 
as a product line, but the actual state of the literature is, is quite undeveloped. So essentially, I, I see it as a, as a combination of insurance economics and information security economics. Um, insurance economics is really very well established as a field. There's a huge body of literature out there covering many aspects of the demand and supply side of insurance and to cover that would probably require a seminar series in, in itself. Um, but I will highlight the key results um, which are important for our research. And then um, information security economics is somewhat new. I, I think it's fair to say it's all sort of strong growth and had its genesis in the early 2000s and um, what's become known as the Gordon Love model which you will hear plenty on um, in due course um, was published in 2002 and really sort of I think my understanding is it sort of really sort of founded the um, founded the field and sort of spawned the body of um, literature thinking. Now, how can you think um, in sort of traditional economic terms about the problems of, of information security? And it really provides sort of a framework and some rigor for uh, considering the trade-offs, cost-benefit analyses, all these sort of um, fundamental economic concepts, but translated on security, which can be tricky in some ways because we know the edges can be quite sort of blurry. It's not as clear cut, say as um, trying to cover, you know, theft of a car, for example, you know, you either, your car is either stolen or it isn't, maybe you get it back, maybe it goes missing, but, you know, the act of theft is quite clear what it is. For information, it's, you know, it's, it's a bit less tangible. Um, and then that brings us on to cyber insurance. And the research coverage here is quite, is quite patchy, really. Um, when I did a systematic literature review um, earlier this uh, year, you know, I, I found maybe a hundred papers realistically in scope. There's um, a range of things out there covering sort of game theory, economics, market structure. But when you start to divide it, then you quickly whittle down to there maybe being a handful of papers in each category, which really make a, um, a useful contribution to the field. So there is a lot of scope, I think, for, for research in this um, in this area, and also for a bit more organization and structures of field, which obviously will develop over, over time as, as more papers are hopefully published, but it feels like it's a bit, um, a bit lacking at this stage. And I think partnership between industry and academia is crucial because there's a real, um, there's a real lack of data publicly available for researchers on um, sort of cyber insurance claims, for example. Um, and, and that really is, is one of the key barriers to, to research. Um, there's also not a great degree of commercial advantage to providers sharing data. You know, if you have three or four companies who are really good at cyber insurance, you know, why do they want other entrants into the markets if they're comfortable that they can charge a price that's actuarially appropriate and covers their, their risk base and they hold all the data so that they're well placed to assess that. It, it's very hard to externally verify that. And that, that's, that's not a new problem necessarily in financial market research. Um, I used to look at inflation linked markets for many years. And if you work for a bank, as I did, you have access to lots of very useful data and pricing models. From the outside, it's very hard to gain access to, to that. Um, but you know, that's where having some industry contacts can be extremely valuable when you're trying to um, do research in this area. I think the constantly evolving nature of the threat landscape is also makes it quite Quite, quite tricky. Um, you know, cyber attacks get more and more sophisticated over time, and you know that makes them potentially from the supply side of insurance trickier to insure in, in terms of wording the policies carefully, being clear what you're covering, what you want to cover. Um, and I think um, it, one thing which is worth pointing out is it's usually presented as a unified product to the customer, but in reality, it's an amalgamation of existing product lines and the uh, Romanowski et al paper here from Weiss um, a few years ago is really excellent on that front. They went through a load of insurance policies filed with state regulators in the US and sort of dissected some, you know, what effectively was cyber insurance. So that's really useful. And there's a couple of other papers here by Woods et al and Nurse et al, which sort of are looking at the um, way cyber insurance is priced, some of the data, the claim forms, for example, are analyzed in the Woods paper. And those are those are quite um, quite accessible as well for anybody who wants to read a bit more sort of into the field and gain a deeper understanding of um, sort of the micro details of, um, of cyber insurance. So I said that the uh, work I've done is extending the uh, Gordon and Love model. So I thought it best to 
explain um, what that is for those unfamiliar with it. So it's originally published as the Economics of Information Security Investment in TISEC back in 2002. Um, it introduces the concept of a security breach function, which is basically a function of the amount of investment you put into defending a set of information and V its vulnerability. So essentially the um, probability that you know, if you try and attack that data set, you'll um, succeed in doing so. And then there's the three assumptions, which uh, I think are fairly, fairly standard. You know, if you, um, if you, if the data set is impenetrable, very on risk in practice, then obviously the probability of the security breach function returns zero. If you make no investment, then it's vault. Then you know, the probability of it being breached is its inherent vulnerability. And then there's a few other um, other conditions um, here in terms which govern sort of the um, form and sort of shape of the, um, of the security breach function. This is intended to be um, fairly generic. In reality, Gordon and Love um, proposed two um, security class of security breach functions, which are what I use. Um, and various people have published counterexamples and, and so on and so forth. But for me, that's sort of a useful exercise that deviates from the fundamental point of the model, which is trying to find a way of rationalizing and thinking clearly about the um, about the problem. And the, the key parameters are the vulnerability, and then you have the loss conditioned on a breach occurring, L, and the probability of a threat occurring. Those are held constant, so effectively um, you have L and tau held constant, and then L times tau uh, times V is basically the expected loss for that um, data set. And, the key output from the Gordon Love model, which um, generally one would be interested in, is the expected net benefit of investment in information security, or NBIS, which rolls off the tongue rather more easily, um, which is um, which is given uh, given here by um, by this expression. So the um, the two forms of security breach functions um, from the original paper take these two forms. Um, these, um, I think, to be honest, were chosen because they, they yield the um, nice result, which is the main, um, main sort of key finding of the Gordon and Love model, or key sort of proposition, I, I suppose, which is that the optimal investment in defending a data set, Z star, is always less than 1 over E times the um, expected loss, i.e. you should spend no more than 1 over E of the um, expected sort of loss um, on defending the um, on defending the data data set and um, these two graphs simply show you for a data set with a vulnerability of um, 0.65 which is a fairly standard example chosen in some of the um, papers on the Gordon and Love model in literature where they were thinking of applied applications um, and it just shows you what the security breach functions um, look like with increasing um, investment and then the expected um, net benefit of investment in security and the dotted line on the right hand graph um, shows you the limit and you can see that for this particular setup actually the optimal investment is is less than um, less than one over one over e times um, times the expected expected loss which I think you would you know it, it's entirely it depends on the functions you choose to model your problem and that's not necessarily the, um, the focus of, of this work but clearly for an industry setting this is something which people would take a great deal of time and care calibrating and, um, and thinking about to um, for risk management purposes. So um, in terms of extending the um, Gordon and Love model to cyber insurance um, the way I've approached it is to consider basically a very classical um, insurance model, which has two states, um, loss or no loss. Um, so basically this equation essentially has two terms. The um, left is the no loss state and the um, right is the loss state. Um, effectively thinking about the no loss state, you have whatever your security budget is. Um, for simplicity in, in my work, I've tended to set that equal to the um, expected um, expected loss, just to see how the system behaves. Obviously, it's, it's an um, arbitrary parameter. You can set it to whatever suits the particular circumstance. Z, the um, amount of investment um, committed, and then P, which is the premium you pay for insurance coverage. And then the only real difference in the right-hand loss term 
is that, that assumes that you've made the loss um, and but you get the cover back, i.e. how much you chose to insure. Because you could insure, if you have what's called full cover, you're insuring the full value of your data set. But depending on the price of the insurance, you may decide, OK, I'm happy to, based on my risk tolerance, insure only half of it, for example. And um, uh, the results um, I've produced from this model um, show some ways of thinking and simulating um, those, sort of, um, those sort of decisions. And I guess the key step here, which I, I think is innovative, is the integration of or incorporation of the Gordon and Loeb security breach functions as the um, probabilities. Normally in the insurance literature, the probability of a loss is known as pi. Um, just by convention, that's some probability. And uh, I thought it made sense to actually allow the investment you make in security defenses to interact with the um, model you're using to simulate your um, cyber insurance um, decision. Um, and obviously, they, there needs to be, to be able to solve this, you need a constraint. And the constraint I've imposed is that while we've seen that under the Gordon and Love model, the optimal um, amount of investment may well be less than limit. It may make sense to ensure the residual risk. You know that adds another dynamic. So the constraint I've imposed is that the investment Z plus the premium rate expressed the percentage of cover um, should be less than or equal to the um, Gordon Lerb um, limit. That then sets up the um, optimization problem um, you can see there, and. Um, in theory, the uh, way you would solve that is sort of very classic uh, Lagrange, Lagrange multiplier problem. And then um, in economics, they usually call it first order conditions, Kuhn Tucker conditions. And um, these, are, these are detailed um, here. The, the, the problem uh, is, and this all looks very nice and well behaved, the problem as with anything in economics here is that you get a very nice set of conditions. And then actually getting some results is not necessarily um, straightforward um, analytically for reasons that will become uh, hopefully clear. Um, so a, a, a quick primer on um, economic utility. Um, and again, you could, you could fill a book with this, but um, this is designed to basically be a, um, a quick illustration of the results sort of you, you need to know to understand them. Um, this work. Um, basically, there's two forms of um, utility function. We look at um, constant absolute risk aversion, or CARA, which is basically a pretty standard exponential function, and then constant relative risk aversion. Um, and here I just use a simple logarithmic case. And you can see that the absolute and relative risk aversion coefficients are, are detailed here. And again, pretty um, pretty standard, um, standard formulations, but just so it can sometimes get a bit confusing when you're trying to think about what's meant by sort of, you know, there's a lot of acronyms. And um, I always find it helpful if you just understand that it's basically the ratio of the second and first derivatives of whatever you're looking at, or with a multiplier with whatever parameters you're investigating, then it, it sort of um, clears it up. But this isn't always well explained um, in some introductory um, text. So I thought it was worth worth clarifying, for clarifying it for the sort of non-economists um, here. So in, in terms of the um, key simulation parameters, and this is really for, um, for completeness, um, I, I set sort of in the Gordon and Loeb um, security breach functions, alpha equal to this and then beta equal to one, which um, basically matters for the first breach function. So effectively just um, keeping it fairly, um, fairly simple um, at, at this stage, because it, it was aimed at seeing whether the the combination of the two models would produce useful results. And then the rest are given here. I, I just assumed um, the value of the data set of half a million dollars, a um, tau of 0.8 to give 400,000, which is an example which has been used sort of in the literature as a um, sort of you know general sort of ballpark figure in terms of in terms of losses. Um, but again, the, these parameters really I, I would stress are quite arbitrary and it's just I've calibrated them in such a way that the equations give decent results, but you can really set them to whatever you want. And, you know, it, it depends, you know, in, in terms of the losses, you know, obviously if you're dealing with a more valuable data set then you probably tweak your alpha and beta just to make sure everything's roughly about the right, um, right scale. Um, but it, it's basically as with anything, there is literature out there on how to, um, how to estimate these for the Gordon Loeb model and some um, econometric estimators, but, you know, and that, 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 
might work well in some use cases. But as I said earlier, with cyber insurance, we really suffer from a lack of data. So having a robust estimator is fine, but if you've nothing to estimate it with, then um, it's not a great deal of um, great deal of use, unfortunately. So these um, graphs show the um, show some results from the model setup. So this is just the basically the simplest um, case of the model where we've assumed um, optimal investment. So you invest Z star, whatever the Gordon Love model tells you it is. Um, the way I, I went about this simulation was I used Julia to do it because I think it has a very nice plotting package, but also it, it, um, the advantage is it's computationally very quick. It can cope with Greek symbols, um, which is great when you're working with, um, with economics or things rather than having to sort of do uh, sort of variable letter variables in Python and try to map them across to your, your equation. So that, that was a distinct advantage for, for me. Um, but then obviously you can um, set up, it's trivial to set up functions to deliver all the key Gordon Love parameters, calculate the optimum for your system. And um, basically I had, in the first instance, I was quite keen to try to find a closed form solution for the uh, system of equations. But the problem is because you're dealing with exponential logarithm, <laughs> make functions, once you start differentiating them with a few parameters, obviously you end up with something which is algebraically quite complicated. And there are ways obviously of solving that. And um, but I thought actually with economics, you, you're generally interested in just understanding the way the system behaves. And often you're visualizing it in terms of curves or cost benefit curves and so on. So I thought that in the first instance, this was a, this was a good way of looking at it. So. I simply set the constraint in the plotting function that if the cost of insurance and investment would exceed the Gordon Love limit, then don't plot it. So um, that's quite a neat way of visualizing, I think, the um, constraint that limits the problem. And effectively, what you see here is um, that for most premium, which are sort of lowercase p premium rates, generally utility increases as cover increases, which is the result you'd expect except for in the case of the class one reach functions and logarithmic utility, where when you get up to premium rates above 30%, then the utility starts to decrease. But, you know, I mean, premium rate of um, 40% is clearly not going to be very attractive economically. Um, so I think the results sort of in, in intuitively, um, intuitively make sense. Um, and then if we consider variable investment, but maximum cover, I think, okay, we've assumed that the Gordon Love model in the first case I showed you is a very good approximation of reality, will invest its optimum. We think, what if um, Gordon and Love is not the best to afford? And actually, you should be looking at a pure insurance case. I let's, let's insure everything and then see uh, how much investment um, makes, makes sense in, um, in defense. And this basically shows you at different premium rates, the maximum cover you could get in, in cash terms that um, respects the, um, the cash constraints sort of under different levels of Z. I, you've got a finite amount you can spend um, and the more investment you commit, the less insurance you can buy and vice, vice versa. Um, and then for reference, for both classes of breach functions, again, here the vulnerability is fixed at um, 0.65. The dotted line shows you the Gordon and Love optimum there, so you can get a um, get a sense, you know, of um, how the um, how the sort of dynamics of the system work. And then um, this shows you the utility functions for this um, this case. And and here it's quite interesting. I think you can see that when you have full cover, depending on what the premium is and um, so on and so forth, there's um there's clearly a uh, there's clearly a sweet spot. You know, where you maximise your utility. So if you were quoted a particular premium rate by an insurance provider based on your, um, your circumstances and your security measures and so on, this could be quite a useful way for a risk department to think about you know, the um, decision between when they sit down um, and are asking for budget, whether they take insurance or whether they take investment and, and so on um, and, and so forth. And then, so, so far we've, we've considered the model um, with um, constant vulnerability, but obviously the uh, vulnerability of a data set may, um, may change. So it's worth thinking about um, 
you know how um, how the how the model changes when you introduce um, or you relax the assumption of um, constant um, constant vulnerability. So effectively, here you can see the um, change in the maximum premium rate versus um, vulnerability, which is just simply the um, highest premium rate under the cash constraint again, which is um, which is sort of central to um, to this analysis. You know, this is the highest um, premium rate your equation to which you can ensure um, you can ensure everything. And then um, for the model setup, the right hand graph shows you how the optimal investment um, varies um, versus the vulnerability. You, you, you start to see some slightly strange results um, for the class two breach functions um, as you get to very high um, high vulnerabilities. Um, but uh, I, I think you know, that's a purely a function of the type of the form of the uh, class two Gordon Love breach functions. And I, I think once you get to a data set that's sort of close to fully vulnerable, and if you and if you're sitting on that, sort of you probably want to think about defending it, not insuring it, because you know the that parameter tells you that if somebody attacks it, they're certain to succeed. So you should probably actually take steps at that point economically to try and address the vulnerability of your um, of your data set. And so I think this really, um, this slide really shows you why this work could be useful to somebody. It, it sums up basically for, I've tabulated a range of vulnerabilities here, and this just lays out sort of the um, Z max, which is the maximum amount the Gordon Love model tells you you should spend on information security for each of these um, Vs. And then for the different types, it runs through the um, optimal investment for each class of breach function. And then for those vulnerabilities and the optimal investment, you know, what the resultant probability of the breach here is. So you can see that you can see if you invest the optimum, this is how much you're reducing the vulnerability of your um, of your data set by. And then it shows you the maximum cash premium um, for the model setup with the expected loss of $400,000 and then the maximum premium rate at which you can um, get, get full cover. And full details of this are in the um, paper of the project um, I, I wrote up, and I'm, I'm very happy to share that with anyone who's um, interested. Um, you know, I, I think for me, this was a uh, this was proof that the um, sort of I, the fairly simple idea of translating a classical sort of loss, no loss economic analysis onto the Gordon Love model actually produce something which would have some real use applicability. Uh, I mean, obviously, there's clear work to be done for different use cases and sort of exploring how you would model this for different systems. I think that's what I intend to be the, um, the, next, um, the next step of the, uh, of the project. Um, and then this um, just shows you the uh, utility functions with optimal investment and um, full coverage for Different um, different vulnerabilities. Um, really, this is just for just for just for completeness. Um, as I mentioned, we've been looking at utility else elsewhere. So there's a cross check that the behaviour you see in this table, sort of it, the, the utility functions are broadly speaking well bounded and behaved sort of across the um, across the domain for different um, values of vulnerability. Um, obviously, with the exception of the class two functions, which um, which display some pretty asymptotic behavior as you go to higher Vs. But again, you know, that's a function of the um, form of the class two functions. And if that was your data set, you would, you would, probably, uh, you would probably choose to model it slightly differently. So uh, I, I don't see that as a, uh, as a significant concern, but it did something clearly which um, to be aware of. Um, and so in terms, of the, in terms of the next steps, and if anybody has suggestions, having heard all this, I would be most grateful to, uh, to hear them. Now, I've been thinking that things like a multi-period case or stochastic budget could be quite interesting. Um, so this formulation would assume that at the start of each year, corporations obviously tend to work on annual budgets. You'd have your initial budget, your premium for insurance, which tends to renew annually, and then you've got a um, you've got sort of a um, series of planned and unplanned investments in security. So you know, your antivirus or contract or whatever is a planned investment. Um, hiring in some forensic investigators would be an unplanned investment, say. 
and then CT is the um, mitigation for your loss that you get from from those um, from those investments. So that's something I'm interested in trying to model. Um, I think the two state model is useful for setting up the problem and seeing if it works, but it, it is too simplistic really for a for a real real world um, case. And I, I think as I've been discussing with um, David and Christos, we think there's a rich potential avenue of research and merging rigorous analysis of systems with economic modeling, because we know that for a given V, we can produce useful insights on cyber insurance. But if we can come up with a way of really using systems analysis and sort of taking a really rigorous approach to trying to estimate V for different systems and different classes of systems, that could be a really, really useful contribution because you know, this analysis really does depend on having um, a good, accurate um, vulnerability parameter if you want to rely on the um, Gordon Love model, um, which as I say, is pretty arbitrary. Another approach which looks potentially interesting is um, using um, POMDPs or partially observable Markov um, decision processes. Um, Mikhail Kokendorf from Stanford did a very interesting talk um, to the um, PPLV group um, before um, lockdown one on this and how his group use it to track aircraft. But there are a whole range of applications and there's some quite interesting literature out there on modeling um, penetration tests and so on using um, using that sort of uh, that sort of approach, which I, I think has some potentially quite interesting applications. And also um, multi-attribute utility functions. So here I've been using utility, which basically um, you've got only one dimensional utility um, with you know multiple variables. Um, but there's an argument that you uh, could say have different utility functions, so which prioritize say the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of a data set. So for different organizations, they might favor one over the other. And there's an argument that if you um, take the utility function sort of as a pro product of those um, of those different attributes, then you could further fine, fine tune the analysis and potentially gain some um, interesting results, which would help, I think, make the model slightly more world realistic because you, you know people generally are not making binary choices with um, with security you know you can try and reduce the problem to that a more accurate representation of the thought process is probably considering a few different potential um, potential trade-offs so that um, basically was what I was going to say in terms of the work but I'm very happy to take questions comments and uh, I will try to answer them okay yeah thanks a lot Henry for this deep dive into security economics. I'll stop the recording and then we'll move over to the Q&A session.